I believe that the message God has placed on my heart is going to be a reminder from Paul's letter to Titus. So I'm inviting you now to turn in your Bibles to Paul's letter to Titus. And we shall be reading from Titus chapter 2, verses 9 to 14. Titus 2, 9 to 14. Will you join and read along with me? Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted, so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. This morning, I have titled my message, The Beautiful Gospel. Like everything else, a biblical text must be seen in its original context because meanings always come from the context. And apart from the fact of getting the meaning, we will have to still grapple with how does this message relate to us today. When we are reading the letters of Paul, we should be reminded that after the Lord Jesus, who is the center of our faith, our Lord and Savior, in the providence of God, Paul's writings are very significant in helping us in our walk with Christ. And the 13 letters of Paul, some are long, some are shorter, have been included as a set in our New Testaments and they are placed in a certain order following a very simple logic. That is, it is not following any chronology or significance or importance, but it is following size. So the letters from the longer to the shorter arranged the first nine letters to churches and then the next four to uh, individuals. And now we come to Titus, who is one of Paul's many precious apostolic colleagues. And like the apostle Timothy, Paul will address him also as my true son in our common faith. So he's a trusted member of Paul's ministry team. But here, Titus is a trusted troubleshooter. You see, there are serious problems in the house churches located in the island of Crete. And the problem, unfortunately, stems from the leadership of some of these house churches. False teachers or unbalanced teachers, preachers with impure motives. So we begin to say, so looks like some things never change. Well, friends, yes, we will have similar challenges in the church. Unbalanced teaching and sometimes even some people knowingly using gimmicks to do what they want to do. And why are these people doing it? No prizes for guessing because it's very clear in chapter 1, verse 7 and verse 11. They are going after the money. Very sad. And Paul says that these people are, he calls them boastful talkers. They use deception and their teaching is causing confusion and destruction. Paul even finds a non-Christian Cretan poet, Epimenides from around 600 BC, who says some very strong, strong stuff about his own people in verse 12. So this is not a small problem. But how do we solve this? The solution is very straightforward. You have to rebuke these leaders. 
and if they are willing to change well and good but if they don't then paul says remove them and replace them with some godly leaders this is what paul says so there is a focus on sound teaching several places in this letter and in other letters and what does paul do he says there should be healthy teaching in the church so then from chapter 2 onwards we find a brief synopsis of the kind of groups paul wants titus to engage and teach older women younger women young men and slaves the older women are to be guided especially some not to hit the bottle too hard rather they should be good examples before younger women teaching them several things of course includes things that may not make perfect sense to us in the uh, 1900 years later for example in verse 4 younger women are to get married and have children and basically be stay at home moms well as we can quickly see especially in the context of an urban congregation some of this does not translate the same way for all places and cultures so these kind of directives that we find are not absolute commands for all cultures and all times but we can learn the basic motives and uh, intentions of these directives we will have to wrestle with these culturally embedded directives and sometimes believers may disagree with each other on these minor issues but then titus goes on to talk about what to do with slaves and this is something very beautiful in the closing part of verse 10 i like the reason he gives for the slaves to live in a certain way he says by living in a certain way they will adorn the gospel they will make the gospel beautiful and attractive to other people and paul uses an interesting verb there cosmeo about 10 times in the new testament it's found but it has the basic idea of putting it in order or adorning or making attractive paul says when you live in a certain way you make the gospel beautiful god is the author of all beauty and all goodness and all truth and the gospel of god is also a gospel that is beautiful and god's people are called to proclaim this beautiful gospel god's people are spoken of as a beautiful bride for example in the book of revelation chapter 21 the beautiful bride is called the wife of the lamb and the wife of the lamb is with the lamb forever how do god's people become beautiful and good and how can we beautify the gospel adorn the gospel and proclaim this beautiful gospel now friends this is what this passage is talking about the outworking of god's extravagant grace working in our lives so let's look at verses 11 to 14 now just to remind you that verses 11 to 14 though they are four verses are actually only one sentence in uh, in greek and uh, these chapter divisions and verse divisions came much much later in the history of the church and uh, so keep this in mind we are now coming to the heart of the reason how god expects us to live in a certain way paul will say for what is called a post positive in the greek gar the word that gives the reason for what he has said earlier he says this is the reason why you have to live in a certain way god's people something must happen in the lives of god's people when they say they have received this bountiful grace of god many of us when we meet each other we ask each other how are you doing and some of us may sometimes say yes by the grace of god i am doing well but the question is if we have received this grace of god what is the evidence of that in our lives 
What is the outworking of this grace in our lives? And so we begin to look at this beautiful passage that is there. What does God do? Look at the first thing, verse 11. God always takes the initiative to bring redemption and salvation to the world. You think of the time in Genesis 12. The world is in a mess, Genesis 1 to 11. And God begins his plan of redemption by calling Abraham and then then calling Israel so that Israel will be a blessing to all the peoples of the earth, Genesis 12. That was God's plan, to bless the whole world. And so, here in chapter 2, verse 11 in Titus, he says, the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. God's plan has always been, he takes the initiative to bring salvation. And then, when we read the life of Jesus, the parables of Jesus, in striking ways, we understand that this gracious God who is generous, who seeks the lost, is giving us this beautiful gospel freely for us to receive. So, for example, in Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13, Paul will say, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. There is this beautiful synergy where God is working in our lives and he is asking the Philippian congregation. It's not just about individuals working out their personal salvation. It's about the congregation and especially in that context of living out in a certain way in humility and unity and serving one another like Jesus Christ. He says, but God is working in your life to bring these about. And God's method of working is always grace. God has always been a God of grace. You look at some of the Psalms in the Old Testament, His mercy endures forever. It's the chorus of some of those Psalms. But sometimes when you and I read the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, which Christians sometimes refer to as the Old Testament, makes us think that somehow God was different in the time of the Old Testament. And we are kind of grateful that God has now changed. (laughs) Uh, uh, And now Jesus has come on the scene. Not true, friends. Let me show you one of the most beautiful passages in the Old Testament. I'm asking you to turn to Exodus Chapter 34, 5 to 7. Exodus 34, 5 to 7. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with Moses and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. And so you have this explanation. Who is God? He is the compassionate, the gracious one, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet, he is God of justice. In that slide before you, you see a picture of David Noel Friedman, a man who lived a life immersed in the study of scripture, especially the Jewish scriptures and writings. One of the greatest biblical scholars of all time. You see him holding a small book in his hand. When he was asked once to sum up the message of the Hebrew scriptures. He thought for a second and he said, there is forgiveness. Interesting. This brilliant, great scholar of the Hebrew scriptures, for him the summary of all the scriptures was, there is forgiveness. 
And those are the words of the psalmist in Psalm 130 verse 4. He says, Oh Lord, if you kept a record of my sins, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Therefore you are reverenced. So, friends, God is a God of grace. He is gracious. But when he expects us after we receive this grace freely, he expects us to not consider this grace as something that is cheap. Rather, he expects us that when we receive this grace, it will empower us, it will transform us so that we will all reflect this beautiful gospel that we have. One of the great servants of the church in the past was this German pastor, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Very sad situation when he was hanged. Very early, he was at the age of 39, he was hanged in a Nazi prison because he worked against Hitler's murderous plans to execute the Jews. And we know about six million Jews were killed. He was killed. Bonhoeffer was hanged in April of 1945. But one of his books is considered a classic. It's called The Cost of Discipleship. In that, Bonhoeffer says, cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. But he says, costly grace is costly because it costs a man his life. And it is grace because it gives man the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin. And it is grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it cost God the life of his son. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. Friends, you and I have received this very invaluable, free, but costly grace in our lives. So what should happen in our lives after we have received this beautiful, costly grace and we allow it to work in our lives? Now for some people, following this Lord is a very costly business. An example of that, the whole world saw some six years ago, February 15th, 2015, 21 Coptic Orthodox Christians were martyred in Libya by the ISIS. They stood their ground and they stood for Christ and they were beheaded. This costly grace will cost us our very lives. Are we ready for that, friends? Now, while there could be a variety of fruit we could speak of, of this evidence of this grace, I want to focus on the two most important and beautiful outcomes of God's amazing grace as we find in this passage. Two things that happens when we receive this grace of God. The first thing it says here in verses 12 onwards is that grace leads to godliness, holiness, Holiness without which no one will see God. But what is this godliness? The Bible is quite clear about what is godliness. In fact, Jesus has made it abundantly clear. Godliness, he said, is follow me. You follow me and you will become godly. I know sometimes in our different cultures and church traditions, we may equate godliness with certain external things. And that's not the way I believe the New Testament challenges us. It challenges us in a far more vigorous way because godliness is Christ-likeness. That is what we are called to be, Christ-like. Now, I want us to also read another portion from chapter 3, Titus 3, 4-7. Titus 3, 4 to 7, these four verses, which by the way, again, is one long sentence originally. 
3, 4 to 7. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Did you notice here we read about God is our Savior, Jesus is our Savior, and how does He save us? Here He says, by the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit, who He poured on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So when you read this passage, please understand, the Holy Spirit is the divine beautifier. Don't miss how the triune God is involved in our lives to make us beautiful. We are embraced into the family of God as an heir, Paul says, because God wants his heirs to be beautiful. God is beautiful. He wants us, his heirs, to be beautiful. And the purpose of the Holy Spirit working in our lives, what is the purpose? Empowerment so that we can do certain things? Yes. But transformation so that we be, become something beautiful. And by that, by our actions, the gospel we stand for, friends, becomes attractive and beautiful. I want to tell you a fascinating story that comes from a long time ago at the end of the 19th century, a fairy tale. Some of you may like to just go online and read about it. Uh, it's called The Happy Hypocrite. Yes, Max Beerbohm wrote this and he called it a fairy tale for tired men. Well, it is good enough for men and women. But the happy hypocrite. What is the story about? Very quickly, there is the key character is one rich person, a rich English lord. His name was George Hell. Yes, you heard it. And he was a sinner. He was a wicked man, selfish to the core. But one day, he was watching the theater and he suddenly saw on the stage a young, saintly girl, Jenny Mare. And he fell in love with her. And he didn't want anything else in the world except her. I'm going to go through the story very quickly. And Jenny says, I cannot marry you because I have to marry someone who looks like a saint. And George, hell, did not look like a saint. So he finds a mask maker in his town who gives him the mask of a saint. And after that mask is put on him, he goes again to Jenny and she agrees to marry him. And they are married and they are so happy and they are so happy in living together that he does everything for Jenny. Wow. Some months go by and one day, Suddenly, he is confronted by a woman from his past who recognizes him and comes towards him and she realizes he must be having a mask on. So she tears that mask from his face. He is devastated. He thinks everything is finished. The mask is on the ground. And Jenny also is surprised that why did he have a mask on? But then this woman looks at him and is shocked because his face has become like the mask. It's a beautiful story, friends. But what it is, is also a fairy tale, a story about the work of the Spirit in our life as believers. We put on Christ, but we are ugly even as we come to Christ. But as we put on Christ, the Holy Spirit, as we seek to please Christ, the Holy Spirit is making us more Christ-like. That is 
what God is doing in our life. Grace leads to godliness. That's what Paul, in his way, will also use uh, the words walking in the Spirit or walking with the Spirit as we read in Galatians 5 verses 16 to 26. Godliness, what does it mean here in Titus 2.12? It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. So we choose the values of the kingdom as we wait for that blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Friends, as believers, we are tempted hard to follow the value systems of this world. We also get easily blinded by the glitter of this world that tempt us away from the glories of the kingdom. But when we allow the grace of God to work in our lives, we will become more Christ-like, which is the ultimate goal of God for his children to make us beautiful like our Lord Jesus. The Russian author Fyodor Dostoevsky, one of the most influential writers of all times, and in his huge novel, The Idiot, which took me a long time to read. There is a character called Prince Mishkin, who is the Christ figure in the story. Kind of represents Dostoevsky's view of Christ. And one of the statements from Mishkin's mouth is, beauty will save the world. A couple of times he says that, and the people around him laugh at that. Beauty will save the world. Yes, friends, this beautiful gospel, when God's people live it and let that work in their lives, will be the beautiful gospel that will save the world. The second sign of the beautiful gospel working in our lives is we become people who pursue goodness. Did you see that? In verse 14, he says, God wants to prepare a people that are his very own, eager, zealous to do what is good. God's people are called to pursue beauty and goodness and truth. Pursue goodness. In fact, if you take time to read this short letter, it's a very short letter, you can take your time to read it, you will see the emphasis on doing good. 2.14, it says, a people eager to do what is good or beautiful. And in chapter 3, verse 8, there also you will find that God's people will be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. The word good and there are two Greek words that Paul uses somewhat interchangeably here several times. Agathos and kalos. Kalos is from where you get like calligraphy, beautiful writing. It's beautiful. Good and the beautiful. Let me remind you of other passages you can think about. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. In that famous grace section, we know Paul says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God has prepared in advance for us to do. Friends, we are not saved by good works, but we are saved for good works. That's why our Lord Jesus, Matthew 5.16 said, let your light shine before all people that they will see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. In another passage, in a different context, Paul is admonishing rich Christian women to dress modestly and sensibly. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. Paul wants to remind them that real beauty will not come from expensive jewelry or expensive clothes, but he tells them that you must adorn yourself with good deeds which are appropriate for women 
who profess to worship God. Friends, beauty and goodness are integrally related. No wonder in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 18, at the end of that letter, Paul tells Timothy, command them, that is the rich people in the congregation, to do good, to be rich in good deeds. And here in the same place, he uses agathos and kalos, both. And to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves in a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Friends, we believe that God is going to bring one day a new heaven and a new earth. That's what Revelation 21, 22 talk about. And God's people are going to come there onto that new heaven and new earth and to lay a foundation, as Paul says, for that coming age, we need to live out the beautiful gospel of generosity and beauty. And Paul says, that is what your life, let your life be full, be zealous for doing good. Doing good for others. And read Titus, just in this short letter, so many times, even at the very end, for example, 3.14, he will say, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs, but also not to live unproductive lives. God has called us as God's people to be those who pursue goodness. I just want to mention this, that the Nobel Prize, the last time an Indian got a Nobel Prize was about seven years ago. I don't know whether you remember who that person was. We've had four others receive prizes before. Rabindranath Tagore in 1913 for literature, C.V. Raman in 1930 for physics, Mother Teresa in 1979 for peace, Amartya Sen in 1998 for economic studies. But the person who received the uh, Nobel Prize, the most recent, is a man called Kailash Satyarthi. He's an amazing person. In fact, there's a very interesting story behind his name, Satyarthi. That was not his family given name. He changed his name because of very interesting reason. Go online and find out. But Kaila Satyarthi has been fighting for the rights of children in our country and around the world. He is supposed to have rescued more than 80,000 children who were kept as bonded labor and made to work. Friends, why would somebody want to do that? And why does it become beautiful that the world recognizes good and beautiful? There is a free movie that you may like to watch on YouTube and several other places where you can listen to this man. The Price of Free, a movie that you can see. Beauty of goodness. Let me tell you about one more person who received the Nobel Peace Prize three years ago. Dennis Mukwege in 2018 again got the Nobel Peace Prize for his work in Congo. Dennis is a doctor. Dr. Mukwege has been serving his own people in very difficult situations. He's a gynecological surgeon. He has performed about 40,000 surgeries on women's bodies that have been mutilated by war. It's a horrible situation. And he reconstructs their bodies. Sometimes up to 10 surgeries a day. The beautiful thing about Dennis is also that he's a pastor. He's a Pentecostal pastor and the son of a Pentecostal pastor. Along with being a surgeon. Friends, God's grace has been given to us. So that we will live in a certain way so that we will make the gospel beautiful by our Christ-likeness and by our goodness, pursuing beauty and goodness. Three key words I have shared with you. Grace, 
godliness, goodness. And who is the divine beautifier? The Holy Spirit. And when we allow the Holy Spirit, we yield to the Holy Spirit in our lives, He will shape us. He will apply divine cosmetics on us and change us. The cosmetics of grace, humility, amazing love, forgiveness, gratitude, generosity, things that will put a smile on God's face because He sees us, His people, becoming more and more beautiful. That divine Holy Spirit, the one who will come alongside us, not leave us alone. Are we willing to submit our life to Him? Can we give our lives in His hands? Can we pray this day, Lord, let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. All His wondrous compassion and purity O Thou, Spirit Divine, all my nature refine till the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. What a wonderful calling you and I have received. Those of us who seek to follow the Lord Jesus, the beautiful one, God is calling us to live in such a way that we will adorn this gospel and make the gospel beautiful, available and attractive to the world around us. May the Holy Spirit help us to become beautiful and to proclaim the beautiful gospel. <laughs>